Starting off this countdown, we have John Reed. John Reed was one of the seven witches tried in 1697 Scotland. When he was caught, persecutors found that he had a mark on his loin. John said that the devil had nipped him there and that it indeed was a witch's mark. John also confessed that he was in service with the devil. The devil promised him wealth and abundance, but in return, John belonged to the devil. But John revealed that the devil broke his promise and never did anything he said he was going to do. On top of that, John admitted to attending a number Number of meetings with other witches. He also admitted that he was responsible for the torment of Christian Shaw. Christian was an 11 year old who claimed she encountered a pack of witches who then bullied her and stole her milk. He also admitted that they all drowned her in the local well. As a result of his confession, it was very clear that he was a witch and he was locked away in a cell. The next day though, he was found dead. He had hung himself in his cell with his own scarf. It was believed that this was the devil's work. The devil convinced him to take his own life because John exposed him. Within the following weeks, the other witches close to John took their own lives in their cell as well. Again, it's thought that the devil possessed them and killed them off one by one because he was pissed with them. In our fourth spot, we have Janet Howitt. Between in 1661 to 1663, 44 people in Fofor, Scotland were accused of witchcraft. Seven of those accused were executed. The fate of some of the others remain unclear. One of the main women was Helen Guthrie. She was not a nice lady at all. This woman murdered her own stepsister and the stepsister's children. But she was like, wait, 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 I'll help you, and claimed that she was able to identify other witches just by looking at them. So she said she would help them in the witch hunt if they went easy on her. She then went on to make up elaborate stories of witches meeting up at graves and eating the flesh of other humans, etc. The more she made up and pointed fingers, the longer she got to live. And same with her daughter, Janet Howitt. Janet was also accused of being a witch like her mom. In fact, she had a witch's mark on her shoulder. She said it was from the devil biting it. She also said that it hurt for so long until the devil visited her again and stroked her shoulder. When he did that, the pain immediately stopped. Now, Janet was imprisoned with the rest of the accused, but we don't know what happened to her. They held a trial for her and no one testified against her. Plus, they only had the mark on her shoulder as evidence. We truly don't know if young Janet was let go or sadly killed. What we do know is that her plea date was 1666, four years after her arrest. So she was in jail for quite some time. In our third spot, we have the Witches of Huntingdon. The Witches of Huntingdon were several individuals in the UK who were found guilty of witchcraft. First, we have Elizabeth Weed. Apparently one night, three spirits came to her and told her to renounce God and make a blood pact with the devil. So she listened and that's what she did. John Winnick also did the same, but only agreed to if the spirits would help him out financially. Others, including John Clark Jr., were also visited by these spirits and decided to also renounce God and make a deal with the devil. Out of the nine people accused, five were found guilty and hanged. Well, John Clark knew that they were going to search everyone's body for their witch's mark, which they all had. So what did he do? He cut off his three days before he was searched. Literally gouged it out of his skin so that the mark was gone. But I'm kind of confused because wouldn't that create another mark? I don't know, but I think he was let off the hook while he watched his friends be killed. He literally said, and I quote, it was foolish to let the authorities find their marks. I cut off mine three days before I was searched. He then denied ever making a pact with the devil or being a witch, even though he was. Moving on to number two, we have George Jacobs Sr. George Jacobs Sr. was an English colonist who was accused of witchcraft in 1692 during the Salem witch trials. George was quite the man around town. He had several run-ins with the Law. He was known for having a violent temper, and in 1677, hit a man named John Tompkins Jr. Two witnesses said, and I quote, One blow, and if the latter had not held him by the arms, he would have struck him some more, he being in such a passion. Now, he was fine for this. Then in 1674, he was sued by his neighbor after he chased some of his horses into the river where they drowned. He argued that the horses were trespassing on his property, whereas others thought he just liked wreaking havoc on town. Fast forward several years later, George Jacobs Sr. and his son, George Jacobs Jr. and his daughter-in-law and granddaughter were all accused of witchcraft. Everyone got off except for Jacobs Sr. And that's because he had a witch's mark. His body was searched and they found what was described as three teats 
on Jacobs. It was thought that if a person had an extra nipple, that this was a sign that they were a witch. Why? Well, it was believed that the extra nipple or teat was from when the devil or some demons sucked the witch's blood as a form of nourishment. It was said that Jacob Sr. had three of them. One in his mouth, one on his right shoulder blade, and one on his hip. Now, they weren't actually nipples though, it was just a quarter inch long fleshy thing protruding from his skin with a sharp point. They proceeded to stick pins in each of them to see what would happen. This was called the witch pricker. Apparently if you are pricked and you don't have a reaction to getting pricked and you don't bleed, then you are a witch. Well, when they pricked each teeth, Jacobs never reacted to it and he didn't even bleed. So he was found guilty in August 5th, 1692 and was sentenced to be hanged along with the other witches. And in our number one spot we have Elspeth Rioch. Elspeth Rioch was an alleged witch in Scotland during the early 1600s. When she was 12 years old, she claimed that she was approached by two men. One was dressed in all black, the other in green tartan. The man in green told her that if she followed his instructions, that she would be able to obtain magical powers. He told her to boil an egg and use the condensation from cooking the egg and take it and rub it on her eyes with unwashed hands. Sounds like an eye infection to me. He said that this would give her the powers to see and know everything that she wanted. So she followed his instructions and bam, it actually worked. So now I kind of want to go home and try it. I don't know, maybe it will work. And she actually developed clairvoyant skills. When Elspeth was older, she was visited again by the men. This time it was only the man in black. He showed up in her room one night. He told her that he was neither dead nor alive, but trapped between heaven and earth. He also told her that to maintain her magic skills, she needed to act dumb. That way, no one would suspect a thing. They'd be like, she's not a witch. No, she's way too dumb to be one. Well, eventually she was caught. In fact, she got in way more trouble because of her acting dumb. They were all like, she's fully a witch. She tried to trick us. Let's kill her. At her trial in March of 1616, she confessed to using her clairvoyant powers to spy on people, and she would also use magical spells to cure illnesses. Furthermore, when they inspected her body, they found a witch's mark. She had what appeared to be a scar in the shape of bite marks on her shoulder. Later, she confessed that she was bit by the devil and that was the mark that he left. She was charged with witchcraft and deceiving locals by pretending she was mute. In the end, she was executed by strangulation before having her body burned. Alright guys, that's all for today's video. Let me know in the comments below, do you have any interesting like birthmarks or marks on your body that people would look at and be like, bro, you're a witch. Let me know in the comments below because half the time it was just a birthmark and they're like, oh, she's for sure a witch. She's like, what do you mean? I was born this way, you know? Lady Gaga, baby, I was born this way. Coming in at number five, we have Alice Keitler. Dame Alice Keitler was the first recorded person condemned for witchcraft in Ireland. Alice was born in the county of Kilkenny in Ireland in 1263 and had been married a total of four times. In 1302, Alice and her second husband were accused of killing her first husband, but due to her vast wealth and involvement in money lending, these accusations were dropped. When her fourth husband John Lepard fell ill in 1324, he expressed the suspicion that he was being poisoned by his wife. At after his death, the children of John and Alice's past husbands accused her of using poison and sorcery. Along with these allegations, she was also accused of denying the faith of Christ and the church, cutting up animals to sacrifice to demons at crossroads, holding secret nocturnal meetings in churches to perform black magic and undermined and overpowered the church, using sorcery and potions to control Christians, the murder of her past husband, and the possession of Robin Artisan, a lesser demon of Satan. Richard de la Dred Richard de la Dred. Richard de la Dred, the Bishop of Ossory, sought to uphold the laws of the church and morality, so when the case of Alice Kettler came across him, he began an even larger project of addressing witchcraft. Richard made many attempts to have Alice arrested due to the many allegations against her and her use of witchcraft and black magic, but because of having powerful friends in the delay of the trial, Alice was able to flee, and it's believed that she fled to England but could never be found and arrested. Some of the people who were said to be working with Alice were captured and stood trial. One of them being one of her servants, Patronilla de Mep, who confessed to working with Alice in such things like committing heresy, sacrificing to demons, making love and hate potions to corrupt the church, engaging in 
sexual affair with a demon and murdering her past husband. Alice was dark and manipulated many people around her to follow her and participate in witchcraft, and to this day it's not confirmed where she fled, but when she did, she was never seen again. In at number 4 we have Agnes Sampson. Agnes Sampson was a Scottish healer and a witch. She was involved in the North Berwick witch trials in the later part of the 16th century. Agnes lived in East Lothian, Scotland, and was considered to have healing powers and worked as a midwife. In the summer of 1590, King James VI was on a voyage from Denmark to Copenhagen after marrying Anne of Denmark, and on their way home a storm arose and this made James believe the storm wasn't a coincidence. He believed that many people had unusual abilities and was greatly perplexed of the idea of witchcraft and black magic. So he began a witch hunt in Denmark, which was where the Copenhagen witch trials were started by the Danish Admiral Peter Munk by King James's request. By the autumn of 1590, Scotland was aflame with witch hunts, and many of those sent to trial were questioned by the king himself. Agnes was accused of being a witch by Gillis Duncan and was arrested along with others, and she was questioned heavily about her role in the storm raising. Agnes eventually confessed, and her body was shaved to reveal a witch's mark. Agnes Sampson had made a charm that she was able to raise a storm and change the winds. She confessed to causing a storm that drowned Jane Kennedy in September of 1589, when ferry boats collided during a sudden storm started by Agnes. The same charm raised the storm and weather effects that threatened the king on his return voyage from Denmark in 1590. King James actually was the one to interview Agnes and was very convinced of her guilt. She was convicted of witchcraft and was sent to be executed. She had been taken to a scaffold on Castle Hill where she was strangled and then burnt at the stake in January 1591. It is believed and seen by many locals that the naked ghost of a bold Agnes is said to roam in the palace of Holly Roadhouse, haunting the people there. Coming in at number 3 we have Merga Bien. Merga Bien was a German woman convicted of witchcraft and perhaps the most famous of the victims in the Fulda witch trials in 1603 to 1605. Merga was born in the city of Fulda and she had been married a total of three times and was the heiress of her first two husbands. In 1588 she had married her final husband, Blasius Bien, and moved to the city but eventually returned after an apparent conflict with her husband's employer. At the time, Prince Abbot Balthauser von Dernbach, who had returned to power in 1602 after a long exile, ordered an immediate investigation of witchcraft in the city, after multiple reports and sightings. While in power, there were over 200 people who were executed for witchcraft in witch trials that lasted until his death in 1605. In March of 1603, the investigations resulted in the first wave of arrests in the city. On June 19th, Marga was arrested and put into jail after signs of being involved with the devil and having supernatural abilities. Her current husband husband pointed out she was pregnant, but still that did not matter. It was actually believed that her current pregnancy was the result of intercourse with the devil himself. While in jail, she confessed to the murder of her second husband and her children with him, and one of the member of her husband's employers, and that she had taken part in the Sabbath of Satan. Bien was convicted of witchcraft soon after her confession and was burnt alive at the stake in Folder in late 1603, and to this day she is still known as being one of the most dominant witches in Germany. In at number 2 we have Marlin Mottstotter. Marlin Mottstotter was a Swedish witch from 1613 to 1676. She is known as one of the few people in Sweden confirmed to have been executed by burning for witchcraft and the only one to be executed by this method during the famous witch hunt known as the Great Noise in Sweden during 1668 to 1676, which had ended with her execution. Since 1668, a national witch hunt raged throughout Sweden ever since the accusation of Marit John Stotter resulting in the establishment of witch commissions around the nation and execution of around 280 people. The accused showed signs of being witches along with abducting children to the witches' sabbath of Satan in Blokula. Marlin Mottstotter was among the accused and not much is known about her background, but what we do know is that she had been married a couple of times and had two daughters with her first husband, Eric Nilsson. She was also known to work as a midwife and was actually hired by a woman named Anna Zippel, who actually accused of witchcraft as well and had been executed for being a witch. Slater found that Anna taught Marlon the ways of witchcraft and sorcery. In 1676, Marlon was reported for witchcraft by her 19 year old daughter, Maria. Marlon was brought to trial for the accusation as her daughter Maria testified against her mother, stating that she had taken her and several other children to Satan in Blokula, and that Satan himself, known to the children as the mean one, appeared in court, with horns standing next to her mother, holding her skirt, and whispered in her ear, never to confess. Marlon was ordered by the court to fall on her knees and pray, or be able to confess, but she didn't obey. Along with Maria, 10 year old and 7 year old both testified to have been abducted by Marlon to Blokula to see Satan. A woman named Gertrude also also testified against Marlon stating that she had abducted her family to Satan 16 times and even another 14th 
14 times while she was in prison. Also, she had seen her family endure fits while being supernaturally beaten by Marlin from prison. Marlin's firm denial of these crimes was seen as a sign that the devil assisted the witch to withstand interrogations. Finally, in July of 1676, Marlin was found guilty and sentenced to be executed. And finally, in at number one, we have the Salem Witches. The most well known cases of witches in history, and you may have heard of them, are the witches from Salem. The Salem witch trials of 1692 are still widely talked about today. Witchcraft scared a lot of people throughout history. The thought of being the thought of people possessing supernatural powers was widely talked about and many people were accused and labelled as witches. The Salem witch trials in particular were a series of hearings and prosecutions of people who were accused of witchcraft in colonial Massachusetts between February 1692 and May 1693. More than 200 people were accused of possessing such abilities, a total of 30 people were found guilty and 19 of them were executed by hanging. Among the 19 killed were 14 women and 5 men. Also of the 200 accused, many were sent to jail and at least five of them died there. Arrests were made in numerous other towns beyond Salem, like in Andover and Topsfield. The trials for the so-called capital crime were conducted by the Court of Oyer and Termina in 1692 and by a superior court of judicature in 1693. Both were held in Salem, where the mass hangings took place. This was the deadliest witch hunt in the history of colonial North America. Only 14 women and two men had been executed in Massachusetts and Connecticut during the 17th century who had been accused of witchcraft. Among the accused were Elizabeth Hubbard and also Dorothy Good, who were also accused of witchcraft. In February of 1692, Betty Paris and her cousin Abigail Williams, who were the daughter and niece of a respected reverend Samuel Paris, started acting strangely, and would have fits described as beyond the power of epileptic fits or natural disease to affect by Minister John Hill. The girls screamed through things around the room, uttered strange sounds, crawled under furniture, and contorted themselves into odd positions according to eyewitness accounts. The girls also complained of being pinched and pricked with pins, but when they went to a doctor, he could find no physical evidence of any ailments on either girl. After the news of these odd behaviours started spreading around Salem, other young girls began experiencing similar behaviours. No one had any idea of where these strange behaviours were coming from or why the girls were acting in such an odd way. Massachusetts was a very religious town back then and these girls were acting as if an ungodly being was inside of them. And so they had been accused of witchcraft and many historians debate on how many of these 200 accused were actual witches but some definitely were and they had brought fear to the people of Salem. If time travel ever gets invented, I'd have to be very careful about not being branded a witch back in the olden days. Like back then, all you had to do was breathe wrong and you could be convicted of witchcraft and sentenced to death. Sadly, most of the folks that were accused were just innocent people that happened to be outspoken or just not well liked by their neighbors. And as somebody who refers to herself as an ooky spooky girly and dresses like this, I'd be damned before I open my mouth to say hello. Speaking of which, howdy folks, I'm Alexa, and let's dive into some awful stories together. Now I'm starting off today's list with the first person that came to my mind. The Great Rasputin. Close family friend of the last royal Russian family, he was originally introduced to them as a faith healer who could aid their only son, Alexei, who suffered from hemophilia. A self-described mystic and holy man, Rasputin was a figure of much debate amongst the royal court, with some describing him as a visionary and prophet, others as a charlatan and scam artist. Historians believe that his scandalous reputation and influence over the Romanovs only helped to discredit and overthrow the family. Having taken many pilgrimages to holy monasteries, he developed a reputation as a revered holy man. Gaining a small circle of followers who believed in his miracles, and began leading private prayer meetings, much to the scorn and suspicion of villagers and priests. It was rumored that female followers were ceremonially washing him before each meeting, that the group sang strange songs, and even that they had joined a religious sect whose rituals were rumored to include self flagellation and orgies. Word of Rasputin's activity and charisma began to spread in Siberia during the early 1900s, where he developed many friendships with high-ranking religious leaders, eventually leading to his introduction to the royal family. It's not certain when Rasputin first acted as Alexei's healer, with the earliest record on date being when he was summoned by Alexandra to pray for Alexei when he had an internal hemorrhage in the spring of 1907, with the young royal healing by the next morning. Due to his closeness with the family, Rasputin was allowed intimate access to the family, in situations that governesses to the young royals described as anarchy. Appropriate. One governess in particular was released from her position simply for voicing her concerns about Rasputin being allowed around the young ones while they were clad in nothing but their nightgowns. Another one of the nursery governesses claimed in the spring of 1910 that she was seduced into sexual acts against her will by Rasputin, originally having been a devotee of the man, but was later disillusioned by him. The Empress refused to believe her and said that everything Rasputin does is holy, later dismissing the governess. It was whispered in society that Rasputin had seduced not only the Tsarina, but also the four young grand duchesses. 
Duchess. Rasputin had released passionate letters written to him by the Tsarina and the four Grand Duchesses throughout society. In 1916, a group of nobles led by Prince Felix Yusupov banded together, deciding to assassinate the holy man for his influence over the Tsarina and her family. It is said that the prince invited Rasputin to his place shortly after midnight, where he offered the man tea and cakes which had been laced with cyanide. Rasputin initially said no. But then began to eat the cakes, and to Felix's surprise, appeared unaffected by the poison. Then he asked for wine, which had also obviously been poisoned, drank three glasses, and still showed no signs of distress. So around 2.30 in the morning, Felix excused himself to go upstairs, where his fellow conspirators were waiting, and he grabbed a revolver and returned to the basement, telling Rasputin that he'd better look at the crucifix and say a prayer, referring to a crucifix in the room, then, you know, nailed him once in the chest. Rasputin leapt up from the explosive and attacked Felix, who freed himself with some effort and fled upstairs. Rasputin followed Felix, where he was once again impaled with an explosive, and he collapsed into a snowbank. The group of men that wrapped his body in cloth drove it to the Petrovsky Bridge, and then, you know, they all dropped it in the Malaya Nevka River. If you missed something there, it took a combination of cyanide, multiple rounds of explosives, and drowning before Rasputin met the end of time. There's no way that wasn't witchcraft. Okay, we're gonna move on before I see his face in my nightmares tonight. I already had one last night, I don't need more. So, when it comes to history, some folks stand out for being a hero. Great virtue. Nobody today, though. They're all going to stand out for their descent into darkness. Mary Bateman, a woman born in Assenbury, Yorkshire in 1768, was kind of that sort of person. Her life, detailed in the extraordinary life and character of Mary Bateman, fitting title, reads like a macabre tale of deceit, poison, and a chilling transformation from a seemingly ordinary existence to a practitioner of dark arts. Raised on a farm, Mary transitioned from a farm girl to a servant in Thirsk when she reached her teens. Her life took an ominous turn when she was 20, and she moved to York and worked as a dressmaker. A year later, she found herself entangled in a burglary and subsequently fled to Leeds. Over the following years, Mary's occupation shifted from mantua maker to fortune teller and wise woman, gradually building her reputation in the shadows. In 1792, she married John Bateman, but her criminal inclinations persisted. Robberies, prison escapes, even accusations of working as an abortionist marked her darker exploits. Her criminal activities continued even after her marriage, as she roamed the streets of Leeds, posing as a charitable soul, collecting goods for fire victims, only to keep the gifts for herself. In a peculiar twist, Mary joined the followers of the prophetess Joanna Southcott in 1806. She orchestrated the infamous Prophet Hen of Leeds hoax, claiming that eggs laid by a hen bore apocalyptic messages. A penny was the price of admission to witness these so-called prophetic eggs. However, the truth behind the spectacle revealed Mary's deceitful hand. She had written on the eggs using ink, and cunningly reinserted them into the hen. The year 1806 marked another dark chapter in Mary's life, when she was approached by William and Rebecca Perigo. Claiming Rebecca was under a spell, Mary began feeding them poison pudding, leading to Rebecca's demise in 1808. William accused Mary of both poisoning his wife and defrauding them for charms and cures. Mary's trial in York in March of 1809 painted a picture of a cunning and malevolent woman. The jury swiftly found her guilty of fraud and Rebecca's, well, death. Facing execution, Mary attempted to evade, you know, rope necklace by declaring pregnancy. A panel of matrons assessed her claim, but the jury of women found it false. So on March 20th, Mary met her end at the gallows alongside a couple of men. Oh, but her story does not end here. I wish it did. The after-death fate of Mary Bateman took a gruesome turn. So after her execution, her body was displayed at Leeds General Infirmary, charging visitors for the macabre spectacle. Dissected by William Hay, her remains became a commodity. Strips of her skin were turned into charms, and the tip of her tongue became a morbid keepsake. No thanks. Next up, we have Walpurgna Hosmanen. So her life at first glance was kind of unremarkable. Born in Bavaria between 1510 and 1527, she spent her days as a midwife, aiding her community. But of course, she couldn't be good or else she wouldn't be here. Story took a dark turn in 1587 when she became one of the subjects of a ruthless witch trial in Germany. Now, the charges against her were nothing short of horrifying witchcraft, sorcery, even vampirism. Under punishment, she confessed to a bizarre tale involving a demon named Federlin, who appeared to her in the guise of a male co worker. She claimed this demon led her to pledge allegiance to the devil, promising to free her from poverty. As she recounted in her confession, she'd indulged in macabre rituals with Federlin and the devil himself, consuming the roasted flesh of young humans and drinking wine. She described frequent visits to the devil and her demon lover, often engaging in sexual encounters. And eh, you do what you do. Remarkably, she had the power to make her demon lover leave by simply invoking the name of Jesus. 
hey, if it works, it works. Now, her confession also included acts of harm using a magical ointment that she had received from her demon lover. This ointment was used to end the lives of many, including the young and animals. Her list of alleged victims was extensive, including 41 young humans, two laboring mothers, and a variety of animals. The swift and unanimous decision of the authorities led to her conviction and a gruesome set. Before her execution by burning, she endured multiple branding ceremonies, and her right hand, the very hand she had used as a midwife, was severed. Finally, she met her end at the stake, and her ashes were discarded into a stream. Goodbye. Off you go. Time to travel over to Paris, France, where we meet La Voisin, also known as Catherine de Chais. Not a lot is known about her early life. She learned fortune telling when she was young, and later married Antoine Montboisin, who was active as a jeweler and silk merchant with a shop at Pont Marie in Paris. When her husband's trade business led to bankruptcy, La Voisin supported the family by practicing chiromancy and face reading. In addition to being a fortune teller, she was also active as a midwife, which developed into providing abortions. Her business as a fortune teller gradually developed into manufacturing and selling purported magical objects and potions, also arranging black masses and selling aphrodisiacs and poison to profit from her clients' wishes upon their future. She supported a family of six, though, including her husband, her mother, and her offspring. She was known to have at least six lovers. The executioner André Guillaume, Monsieur Latour, Vicomte de Cousseran, the Comte de la the alchemist Blessis, the architect Fauché, and the magician Adam Lesage. She was, once again, a French fortune teller, commissioned poisoner, I'm gonna emphasize that, and a professional provider of alleged sorcery. She was the head of a network in Paris of witches. So that's how she provided all those poisons, aphrodisiacs, magical services, black masses. She had like a whole network going for her. Her organization of commissioned black magic and poison killings was suspected to have killed over a thousand people, but it's actually believed that around 2,500 people might have met their ends because of her. Yikes. Oh, and by the way, she was a central figure in the famous Affaire de Poison, in case you didn't know. And because I'm in a fun mood today, let's end this with another male wit. Folks really don't like to talk about that in textbooks, but they did exist. So Gilles Garnier was a reclusive loner living in the woods around Dole, France. Despite being a solitary man, he did marry in 1572. Now historians have reported that Gilles was ill-equipped to provide for his family because he wasn't a really good hunter, since he only really was known to hunt for himself. So that's when he started hunting something else. And I wanna guess what? Come on. Yeah, human flesh. The first hunt happened around September 29th of 1572, when Garnier killed a young female, allegedly well in the form of a wolf, and brought some of the flesh home for his wife to eat. How thoughtful. Throughout the autumn, more young humans were found unalived and mutilated, including another young woman that uh, Garnier bit and clawed at, but was interrupted by passerbys before fleeing. Sadly, the girl succumbed to her injuries a few days later. Now in November, Garnier ended the life of a young man this time, enjoying the flesh from his thighs and belly before tearing off a leg to save for later. I could do more, but I'm feeling a little queasy as it is. Now this caused a stir amongst the townspeople, who believes that it was a werewolf who was committing the horrors. Many folks had witnessed a humanoid looking wolf near the scenes of the crimes, with the animal darting off once it was aware of being seen. Then in January of 1573, there was one last death. This time villagers heard a young person screaming and the sounds of a wolf, witnessing the wolf attempt to flee the scene, but changing into the form of Garnier as it did. He was then arrested, put on the rack, and confessed to killing the young and consuming their flesh. At his trial, more than 50 people testified, and he was found guilty of lycanthropy, you know, the ability to turn into an animal, and witchcraft. He and his wife were burned at the stake on January 8th of 1573. A witch and werewolf hybrid? Sounds a little too scary for my liking, unless I'm watching Vampire Diaries, which in that case, Team Damon. Number five on this list is what I'm going to be nicknaming the Scottish Witch from the Woods. I stumbled across a Scottish story about a witch where they were unable to discover her name. Hundreds of years ago, when Scotland was still being first developed, there was a village in the north of the country. This village was positioned directly next to a forest that they wanted to chop down and expand into. When they began their process of chopping down the forest, a witch, or the Witch of the Woods, came out and warned them that if they continued, she would curse their entire community. The woman would become infertile. The crops would never grow and people would go missing. Fearing for their safety, the group came to an agreement with this witch, where they were allowed to chop down a small section of the forest in exchange for leaving one sack every harvest of grain or produce by the edge of the forest. This agreement held true for quite a while until the community started to get less fearful and more greedy. They decided to go against this witch and chop down the rest of the forest without fear of consequence. When the witch came out of the forest again to address their betrayal, they refused to listen and they hung her immediately. Right before she was executed though, she said that the new price was three bags of grain. This fell on deaf ears though, except for one fearful farmer that decided to heed the warning for a little while. The community went on thriving until one 
once again, that farmer's fear was replaced with greed. He stopped delivering the grain, and that very same day, his youngest daughter went missing. The community looked everywhere, but nobody could find her until somebody checked the mill. Through the bricks and all over the walls, blood started dripping down to the ground, and they knew exactly where his daughter went. That mill has since been torn down, but it was replaced with a silo. And to this day, the locals in that area still think that that silo is haunted by the Scottish Witch in the Woods. Number four on this list goes to the Paisley Witches. The Paisley Witches are actually nicknamed after the town of Paisley in Scotland where these witches were based. Christian Shaw was an 11 year old girl who was the daughter of a higher up in the Scottish community. It was this 11 year old girl who fell victim to the curse of several witches. It started with a deep sickness that manufactured itself like any other fevers, chills, exhaustion. But some reports say that it became much more than that. The story goes that Shaw on one occasion levitated from her bed and on another occasion started chanting some deep curse. It was clear to everybody involved, including Shaw, that some form of Scottish witchcraft was a foot. Now she made it evident that she believed multiple witches were involved in causing her ailment, seven of them in fact. A trial was held for these witches where it was discovered that they all had the witch's mark or the devil's mark as some like to call it on their bodies. After this evidence came to light, the jury's decision was easy and all of the witches were sentenced to death. Now this story was a long time ago and it's hard to know for certain whether these individuals had anything to do with Shaw's ailment and witchcraft or if they were wrongly accused, tried improperly properly and the story has been exaggerated over time, which frankly is not unlike other potential witch stories during this period. The only thing that we can say for certain though is that the people back then and the 11 year old Christian Shaw believed wholeheartedly that this group of paisley witches was just that, witches. Number 3 on this list is Helen Duncan. Helen Duncan was a Scottish witch who traveled throughout Europe and actually isn't that far removed from present day. She died in 1956 and is known by some to be the last Scottish witch. As a young girl, she was considered by most to be a normal, albeit outspoken and loud, growing child. It wasn't until midway through her life that she started seriously practicing witchcraft. Helen garnered a name for herself by regularly performing seances every evening and having the ability to communicate with the dead. During her nightly rituals, she would invite viewers to come and watch. These viewers had reported seeing the materialization of ghostly figures directly in front of their eyes when Helen entered her deep, witchly trance. Helen was also capable of and would often excrete a strange looking ectoplasm from her mouth while she was doing this. And if this wasn't enough, Duncan could also see things that others couldn't. At one point, the ghost of a sailor appeared and talked about a very secretive incident that had happened in World War II that the public or Helen Duncan couldn't have possibly known about. After hearing this information, the authorities realized that they couldn't have Duncan revealing any important state secrets about the war and arrested her for witchcraft immediately. It was revealed during her trial that some of her witchy ways were not what people were led to believe though. Like her ectoplasm was simply the regurgitation of a cheesecloth made to look like some type of ghostly substance. Even though some of her abilities were proven to be fraudulent, it still doesn't explain how she was able to accurately predict or say the things that she couldn't have possibly known. Helen Duncan didn't use any of her abilities to harm anyone, but the capability to potentially talk to the dead, it's still very chilling. Number two on this list is Thomas Weir and his sister Grizel. What makes Thomas and his sister so scary is that nobody expected them to be involved in witchcraft at all. Up until the end of his life, Thomas was known by most to be a nice man of the community held in high esteem. However, nearing the end of his life, Thomas came clean about who he really was telling the entire community during a religious service that he and his sister had been performing witchcraft for years. Going into deep detail about how they had consistent communication with the devil and had devoted their entire lives to carrying out his bidding. This bidding manifested itself in many different ways, most of which involved causing harm to others or in Thomas's case, getting it on with animals. Yeah. He was a weird dude. At first the community barely believed him, but after the sister came out and corroborated his story in detail as well, they started piecing it together. Thomas was always walking around with a big black staff. The neighbors had reported hearing strange sounds in the evening coming from their home and weird lights going off. Suddenly the guy that everybody thought they knew as their nice friendly neighbor was somebody else entirely. Reports say that when he was burned at the stake, he took far longer to die than a human should. Also his staff was burned with him and it emitted an extremely strange sound and moved in unnatural directions when it was burning as if it was being possessed by some force. 
I suppose that in the case of Thomas and Grizel, they had done such a good job at hiding their identities as witches and had been extremely methodical with their crimes that before they died, they just had to let the world know just how evil they actually were. Number one on this list is Isabel Gowdy. Isabel was a Scottish witch from the 1600s and frankly, she did everything. Through several confessions that she made on her own accord, without the pressure of torture or coercion from higher ups, Isabel admitted to taking part in a wide array of witchcraft activities. She admitted that she had freely let the devil suck blood from her neck and that she had romantic relationships with the devil before. She admitted to taking the body out of child's graves and using it in a ritual to destroy people's crops. She said that she had made clay effigies or voodoo dolls of someone's children and used these to harm and even kill them. Isabel was also part of a coven, a group of witches whose intentions were evil and had the ability to change their form into animals. She described in detail the brutal murders that she had committed for the devil and her fellow witches. She even offered up information about spells they had used to inflict illnesses on people, uttering some of them to the council she was confessing to. Now it's unclear exactly why Isabel decided to confess to these heinous crimes and oust herself as being a witch. She had to be aware that confessing to these crimes of this nature would surely mean her execution. It had been said though that she felt extreme guilt for her crimes and that's why she decided to come forward and accept the consequences as they were. Regardless of what her intentions were though, Isabel Gowdy has to go down as one of the most dangerous known witches in Scottish history. Number 5, Julie Brown. Our first witch today on the list of which witch is which is Julie Brown, legendary voodoo priestess of the swamps. New Orleans is filled to bursting with two things, the most wondrous advancements in soul food and gumbo technology on the planet and ghost stories. There's a whole lot of voodoo to go around in Louisiana and in Manchac they say there's the ghost of an old voodoo priestess named Julie Brown. The story of Julie Brown is an unnerving one. I would certainly hope so, otherwise it wouldn't be on this list. She was said to be reclusive, would sit on the porch of her swamp shack and spend the day cackling, predicting the demise of nearby towns and its residents, singing twisted songs about her death and the apocalypse and the end of days. Despite the fact that she was a kooky old lady singing songs about the apocalypse on her front steps, locals actually feared her and treated her as an oracle and a prophet and were very nervous of wronging her just in case she placed a hex on them, which, you know, is reasonable. You should always treat everyone you meet with kindness just in case they turn out to be a witch who can hex you. The prediction she's most known for, besides one bizarre correct prediction about the 1994 Super Bowl Cowboys at Bills game, was her threatening prediction in 1915, where Julie Brown would cackle over and over and over that she was going to die and take everyone with her. She chanted this again and again, until her death. On her funeral, a hurricane hit the town, decimating three villages and taking countless lives. Julie is said to be buried in the swamp, and locals believe it was her spirit that caused the hurricane. And if you happen to be passing through Manchac, just pay your respects to Miss Julie Brown. Like I said, you never know what kind of secret somebody has. And if you're looking for more stories about witches or really any kind of urban legend, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. I'm not kidding. If you can think it up, there's pretty good odds we've done two to three videos on it. We got something scary for everything under the sun and above it. So hit subscribe. Please make sure you hit that little bell so you don't miss a single scream, but do that after this video because I got four more witch stories coming up for you right now. And wouldn't you know it, the next one's about a bell. Number four, the Bell Witch. In the 1800s, a farmer going by the name of John Bell moved his family to picturesque Adams, Tennessee onto a beautiful 300 acre farm, little slice of American pie. Bell quickly became a figurehead of the community, respected by many, and became a local leader at the town church. For the Bell family, things were the brightest they've ever been. They were living the dream and ringing in good fortune. 
I was trying to make a bell pun work there. There's probably a better one. Things wouldn't be good for long, and they'd find themselves in a nightmare shortly. By 1817, strange, inexplicable things started to occur all around the farmstead. John Bell found a strange animal on the farmstead, a mutant hybrid that resembled a grotesque mix between a dog and a rabbit. I know that sounds like it would be cute, but I think if you get the wrong parts of both, that's just gonna turn out to be a very, very ugly animal. I think dog, rabbit ears, pretty cute. Maybe like dog, rabbit face, dog, rabbit body. I don't know, mess. Anyway, it was a disgusting thing. The younger members of the Bell family would wake up covered in red scratches all over their bodies at all hours of the day. The family would hear faint whispering and singing that sounded like an old woman singing hymns. Most tragic is the Bells found a mysterious vial of liquid inside their home that no one could explain or understand. Nervous about what it was, the Bells offered the mystery liquid to their cat, which passed almost immediately. Rest in peace, Bell cat, taken too soon, undeservedly. You didn't deserve to be an experiment for them. For three long years, the Bell family was tormented by a mysterious entity that would later become known as the Bell Witch, after the mysterious old woman's humming and singing. In 1820, John Bell quickly grew extremely ill, quickly descending in his health, and would pass away later. At his funeral, the mourners complained they could all hear the laughing of an old woman mocking and singing the fate of the late John Bell. The farm became a haunted attraction, where it still is to this day, and it even caught the attention of President Andrew Jackson, who in 1819, a year before Mr. Bell's passing, visited to see if legends of the witch were real. Allegedly. Allegedly. As soon as his carriage arrived at the property, the horses refused to budge anymore. The animals can always tell. Number two, the Blair Witch. Perhaps one of the most pervasive witches in pop culture after the Wicked Witch of the West, the Scourge of Maryland, the Blair Witch. Perhaps you saw the very successful 1999 documentary regarding her legend, or maybe you saw one of the two middling sequels. According to legends, she haunts the Black Hills Forest near the town of Burkittsville, Maryland. The local folklore states that in the 18th century, a woman named Ellie Kedward was accused of practicing witchcraft. She was chased and exiled out of the township of Blair and condemned to live in the woods, hence the Blair Witch. It's believed that she died out in the surrounding forests in the harsh winter of 1785, but it's also said that she placed a curse on the town moments before her death, vowing to seek revenge on the townspeople and their descendants for generations. And not to split hairs here, but that does actually kind of sound like she was a witch. I'm not saying it was justified in exiling a woman out of her town, just that placing a hex on a town definitely sounds like witchcraft and I can understand where they were coming from. I'm just trying to understand the scenario, okay? I'm divorced from it, I'm not part of it, I'm just trying to understand it. From here, the legends of Kedward grew into the larger than life figure, the Blair Witch. Various disturbing events were attributed to the Blair Witch. Mysterious disappearances, people being lured away into the woods, supernatural phenomena, camera crews disappearing in forests, reports of finding strange hex bags in the surrounding woods filled with strange runes and symbols and remnants of people, hair, teeth, for her to perform wicked rituals. Now, it goes without saying, unless you firmly, firmly believe the marketing campaign of the 1999 film, the Blair Witch Project is obviously a movie. While they say it's based on the real story of Ellie Kedward, there is no record of a Blair Township ever having existed. Almost certainly, the Blair Witch's story is inspired in large swaths by the Bell Witch, who we talked about earlier. Although in a kind of unique case, back in the day when the Blair Witch did come out, its marketing was so effective, and in this sort of like pre-early internet area, there were several people who did think it was real. It was a cast of completely unknown actors by a team no one had ever heard of. And on some level, I don't know, maybe to get esoteric with it, what makes an urban legend real? Just us believing in it, right? Do you believe the other four stories I've told you more? They're no less fictional. My only source was the internet for all of those. So, I'm just saying, open mind. 
starting off this countdown, we have the North Berwick Witches. North Berwick is a small town in Scotland where some of the most brutal and horrific witch trials took place. It all started during the reign of King James VI. While on his way to get his new bride in 1589, he encountered a series of disastrous storms. In fact, the storms were so bad that he was forced to head back home. He immediately thought that the storms were the work of witches. It didn't help that back then a rumor had started that a witch had sailed out on the river forth to conjure up some storms. So from then on, King James was dead set on finding these witches. In fact, 70 to 200 women were accused of being witches. Most of them were tortured and then executed. Now, apparently during these trials, he did come across a number of women that admitted to being witches. They claimed that they had all made deals with the devil and were now under his command. They also claimed that they would use one of the churches there to hold their covens. They even said that this was the place where they had summoned the devil himself. In fact, this church was located right on the seafront, so James was like, aha! The perfect place to conjure up storms. All of you are guilty. As a result, these witches were strangled and then burnt at the stake. In our fourth spot today, we have Sabrina Spellman. Although she's a fictional character, Sabrina still deserves a spot on today's list. Without too many spoilers, the show The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina is about Sabrina, a teenage witch who on her 16th birthday has to sign her name in the Book of the Beast. Upon doing so, she makes a deal with Satan. She basically gives herself to him in exchange for magical powers. At first, Sabrina refused to do so because she didn't want to give up her mortal life. But later on, she was forced into doing it in order to stop a number of evil forces that were murdering many of the townsfolk. Once she signed the book, she is forced to do Satan's bidding. She has to basically bow down to him and do whatever he instructs her to do. In return, Sabrina's magic became even stronger. In fact, she became the fourth witch in all of history to summon demonic blue hellfire, which was then used in order to fight off the Greendale 13. And for her to do that as a relatively new witch, is very impressive. Later on in the show, we also realize that Miss Wardwell is evil and is using Sabrina so she can become the Queen of Hell. Sabrina's destiny took a dark shift as soon as she made a deal with the Dark Lord. Although all the witches in the series have signed this book, the Dark Lord specifically needed Sabrina to sign it. Her destiny is far more different than the other witches in the show. Have you guys watched the show? Let me know in the comments below. Honestly, I did, but after season two, I just... I couldn't anymore. Let me know your thoughts though. Moving on at number three, we have Lilith. Now, the description of Lilith varies depending on your beliefs. In Jewish folklore, Lilith is a female demon. In Luciferian witchcraft and Luciferianism, Lilith is described as the consort of Samael. Other people believe that she is the wife of Satan or that Lilith was the first wife of Adam, but she wasn't that obedient to him and Adam didn't like that, so Lilith left. Then God made Eve who was more obedient. Lilith became jealous and turned into the snake that made Eve take a bite from the apple. The two were banished from the Garden of Eden and Lilith turned into a demon, her main goal, to get revenge on all men. Then you have the people that believe Lilith is a child killing witch. She wasn't able to conceive so she was jealous of pregnant women and would go around killing them or stealing their babies. In this case, we are looking at the version in which Lilith is a witch, obviously. In this case, Lilith is working alongside Satan to do his dark bidding for him. Their deal is that if she's with him, then she will work for him. But she's not always obedient, in fact, she has gotten frisky with other men. In the TV series Supernatural, Lilith is depicted as a white-eyed powerful demon. She is said to be the first human that made a deal with Satan and promised to serve him. As a result, she became the first demon. In the chilling adventures of Sabrina, we end up finding out that one of the characters, Miss Wardwall, is actually Lilith. She is referred to as Satan's concubine and the mother of demons, and of course, she's a witch. In fact, she is said to be the first witch in existence. She made a deal with Satan or the Dark Lord. According to her story, she was wandering the wasteland aimlessly when she encountered Lucifer the fallen angel. She made a deal to heal the wounds caused by the loss of his wings, if he in return helped her. She then pledged allegiance to him and became his handmaiden. In the end, Lilith wants to become his queen, which is why she goes to the extreme lengths to do whatever he tells her to do. Moving on to number two, we have Sarah Good. Now, if you have seen the Fear Street trilogy on Netflix, then chances are you might be a little familiar with this story. The movie was loosely based off of the 
real witch, Sarah Good, but in the movie they changed her name to Sarah Fear. So Sarah was one of the first three women that were accused of witchcraft. It was her, Sarah Osborne, and Tachuba. These two other ladies were said to be real witches, and when they were accused, they brought forth Sarah Good's name saying that she was a witch too, little tattletailers. The townspeople were quick to believe this because Sarah never attended church. She lacked self discipline and self control, and she was 38, but apparently she looked like she was 70. That combined with the other ladies' testimonies had everyone against her. In fact, apparently when she was brought in front of the court, a number of witnesses began to twitch and rock back and forth and moan. So they were all like, damn, she's definitely a witch. Look at what she's doing to the people that accused her of being one. Not only that, but her own husband and daughter even admitted to Sarah being a witch as well. And then things kept getting worse and worse for her. At one point in her trial, one of the accusers started acting out and claimed that Sarah attacked her with a knife. In the end, of course, she was found guilty of witchcraft and was sentenced to death. But just before her death, she made a deal with the devil to curse a priest. She said, and I quote, I am no more a witch than you are a wizard, and if you take my life, God will give you blood to drink. Now when she died, apparently the priest and his land both became cursed, just like Sarah claimed it would. To this day, it's said that Sarah continues to haunt the town searching for those that have wronged her. And in our number one spot today, we have the Bonus Witches. In 1679 in Bonus, Scotland, a number of women were accused of being witches. These women were Annabelle Thompson, Margaret Pringle, Margaret Hamilton, Bessie Yicker, and another woman named Margaret Hamilton. Now during this time, the hype and fear of witches was dying down. So people were shocked that out of nowhere five women were being accused. But rumor has it these women had renounced their baptisms and had been in contact with the devil on a number of occasions. They apparently had eaten, drank, danced, and had intercourse with the devil. Annabelle Thompson even admitted that she had made a deal with the devil for a better life. She had been widowed twice, and so she turned to the devil for help, and in return she would be loyal to him. She then invited the other women to come over and do all these things with the devil with her. Her. The women then apparently formed a demonic pact with each other and Satan. One of the Margaret Hamiltons also admitted that she had met the devil. She claimed that the devil came to her in the form of a black dog. And she said that she was his servant for three decades already. And another was accused of using her witch magic to help get wealth. As a result, all the witches were found guilty and were strangled at the stake before being burned to ashes. In our fourth spot today, we have Gerald Gardner. Gerald Gardner is often called the father of modern witchcraft, and that's due to the fact that he founded Wicca. Although technically he learned it from a group of people and then went on to just write about it, so they gave him credit for it. But anyways, basically back in 1939 he said that one night he encountered a group of women who claimed to be witches. They stripped him of his clothes and put him in the middle of a ceremonial circle. The circle was lined with naked women and they showed him their ways. From there he learned briefly about Wicca and thought, Hey, this is great, let's preserve this and make sure that everyone knows about it. In 1954, he actually created a book titled Witchcraft Today that teaches others how to embrace Wicca fully. He then went on and became obsessed with the occult. In fact, it's believed that a number of Wiccans and pagans were saved partly because of him. They could come out and be like, yeah, I'm a witch without fear of being hanged or burned alive. To this day, he's one of the most relevant witches in history, but also one of the more controversial ones. In our third spot today, we have Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, otherwise known as Ursula Sonthiel, was born in 1488 England. Legend has it that she was born during a massive thunderstorm and her mother gave birth to her in a cave. Her mother was only 15 at the time and was stuck raising Ursula in that cave by herself. That was until the monastery took her mother in and a local family took Ursula in. Eventually her mom was taken to a nunnery and they never saw each other again. Growing up, Ursula had a hard time fitting in. She had a large crooked nose, her back had a bend in it, and her legs were twisted. So right off the bat, people were like, yeah, she's a witch, just because of her appearance. In fact, people would bully her and call her hag face. Others believed her father was the devil. It didn't help that her mom refused to tell anyone who the father of her child was. So people were like, yeah, for sure. Her father's the devil. Not only that, she would spend a lot of time by the cave that she was born in. Now, how did she get the name Mother Shipton? Well, eventually she went on to marry a man named Tobias Shipton, and she took his last name. She eventually did partake in witchcraft and would make magical remedies for the sick. So people called her Mother Shipton because she was like a mother to all. 
At one point in her life, she became psychic and could see into the future. Soon after, she was called the Narenboro Witch. She made a living off of predicting and sharing the future with others. Moving on to number two, we have Isabel Godie. Isabel Godie was a Scottish woman from Aldern, a village near the Scottish Highlands. She is well known in history because in 1662 she confessed to witchcraft and may have been executed. We actually don't know because there's no official record of it, so it's a mystery. Basically, during that time, if you were thought to be a witch, they would torture you until you admitted to being one, even if you weren't actually one. Well, Isabel's case sparked a lot of interest because she admitted to being a witch willingly without torture or anything. And she went into great detail on everything that she was doing. She gave four separate confessions given over a six week period. For example, she said she made a pact with the devil and had been engaging in intercourse with him. She also said that she was part of a coven and would cast spells on the community. She claimed she put a curse on some male authority figures who she felt victimized by. She also cursed her landlord for being a pervert and put one on the local church minister. Lastly, she also admitted that she had the ability to turn into animals and that she was interacting with fairies. Over the centuries, a number of people have analyzed Isabel and have come up with some explanations for her actions. One is that she suffered from psychosis or hallucinations, whereas others think it was a ploy to get maybe a more lenient sentence. But of course, you still have the people who believe that she was an actual witch and did everything that she admitted to doing. And in our number one spot today, we have La Voisine. Catherine Montvoisine or La Voisine was a witch that lived in France in the mid 1600s. Her witchcraft mainly comprised of mixing and creating potions, poisons and medicines. She also would tell people their fortunes and would hold black masses where people could come and make contact with the devil through her. It started off with her just providing palm readings and advice for people. But then she realized that her clients were mainly women who were coming to her with spousal problems. A number of them wanted their husband dead. So she started creating the potions to help them kill their husbands and gain fortune. Then things started to get darker and darker. She began practicing dark magic and witchcraft. This involved her leading a number of satanic rituals in the catacombs under her home. One time she even spilt the blood of an innocent victim as a sacrifice for the devil. Eventually Catherine was arrested for practicing witchcraft and for being involved in a number of murders. She was publicly burned at the stake in 1680. Alright guys, that's all for today's video. Let me know in the comments below which one of these witches you found the coolest or the creepiest. Starting off this countdown, we have Tatuba. Tatuba is a pretty famous name when it comes to the Salem witch trials because she was the first woman to be accused of practicing witchcraft. So Tatuba was a young slave who was under the order of a man named Samuel Paris. She was in charge of looking after his daughter and niece, among other things. Then in the early 1690s, several young girls all over town began acting strange, his daughter and niece included. The girls would contort their bodies, bark like dogs, and babble and cry hysterically, almost as if they were possessed. They also would complain of bruises and pinch marks appearing randomly on their body. So immediately, people thought that they had been cursed by a witch. When she was put in front of a court, at first she denied any involvement. But eventually she admitted to practicing witchcraft. She claimed that the devil came to her and bid her to serve him. She went on to tell this elaborate tale about seeing strange animals, like a hairy creature that walked on two legs with wings and a head like a woman. She also talked about a red cat and how she would ride on sticks and was told by the devil to pinch these young girls. She also claimed that a big black dog came to her and told her to hurt the girls. Her testimony shocked and scared a lot of people. And we don't know if what she said was true or if she was just messing with the people in the court, you know, playing into the whole witch stereotype, or if she really was practicing witchcraft and made a deal with the devil. In the end, she was sent to prison for a year. In 1693, some mysterious unknown individual freed her from jail, and after that, no one heard from her. Moving on to number three, we have Malin Matt's daughter. In July of 1676, Swedish widow Malin Matt's daughter was reported for being a witch. She was reported by her own daughters. They claimed that their mom would abduct a number of children and use them for a number of dark rituals. She was accused during the largest witch trial in Swedish history, the Great Noise. 
Now, was Malin actually a witch or were her daughters just looking to get rid of her? Well, sadly, we don't know for sure. She may have indeed been practicing witchcraft, but she wasn't going around abducting kids. That part was never proven. Anyways, when she was put in front of the court, she always maintained her innocence. Her partner, on the other hand, Anna Simon's daughter, Hack, was also accused of being a witch and apologized for her wrongdoings. These two women were the last victims executed for being witches. Anna was decapitated, but for Malin, well, they decided to burn her at the stake. She was the only witch in Swedish history to have been burned alive. Rumor has it that just before she was burned alive, she cursed both her daughters for eternity and gave them over to the devil. When the flames covered her body, apparently she did not scream, nor did she appear to be in pain. For everyone watching, this was further proof that she was in fact a witch. In our second spot today, we have Dion Fortune. Dion Fortune, born Violet Mary Firth, was a psychiatrist, author, occultist, and witch. For Fortune, it all started at the young age of four. That's when she claimed she started receiving visions. Apparently, the visions were of her being a priestess in her past life. Then at the age of 20, she suffered a mental breakdown as a result of these psychic attacks, as she called them. During her recovery, she found herself drawn to the occult. From there, she began writing a number of books on the occult and witchcraft. In 1924, she founded a fraternity for people interested in the craft. It was called the Fraternity of Inner Light. In the fraternity, they engaged in a number of different practices and rituals. One was the initiation ritual, where the candidate was introduced to magic and witchcraft. The second was evocation, in which people would learn to harness the powers of witchcraft. Furthermore, Fortune was known for her involvement in the magical battle of Britain. Basically, a number of British occultists joined together to help during World War II by using their magic. Shortly after the war ended, Fortune passed away. It's believed that her great effort in this battle caused her health to weaken and weaken. Nowadays, her influence is still strong for practitioners in the Wicca slash witchcraft movement. Moving on to number four, we have Isabel Adam. In 1707, during the witchcraft trials in Scotland, a woman named Isabel Adams confessed that the devil had given her a mark. She claimed that in the fall, she encountered a man with a hat wearing all black clothes. She engaged with the man and it turned out he was the devil and ended up kissing her. He then told her that in his service, she could be as rich as she wanted to. So she decided to renounce her baptism and make a pact with the devil. Upon doing so, that's when she received the witch's mark or devil's mark. And surprisingly, after confessing this all, she wasn't even killed. She was actually freed, she just had to pay a fine. Moving on to number three, we have Elizabeth Jackson. The trial of Elizabeth Jackson was a pretty complex one. It seemed as if she was just an innocent woman whose neighbors wanted to get rid of her. So they created this elaborate story that she was a witch. So this took place in the mid 1600s. Elizabeth Jackson or Elizabeth Elizabeth Howe was accused of bewitching a 14-year-old girl named Mary Glover. At her trial, a woman named Elizabeth Burgess came forward being like, yeah, I witnessed her bewitch this poor young girl. Then she also claimed that she was visited by Jackson herself. During the visit, she was eating prunes when she wasn't able to swallow them and then she threw up. So she believed that this was the result of Jackson putting a spell on her. She then went on saying that every time Jackson visited her, bad things would happen. One time she even claimed that Jackson put a spell on her. She said, and I quote, that she might cast up her heart, guts and all, adding, thou shortly shall have in thee an evil spirit too. The following night, Burgess claimed she was visited by a vision in the shape of a fox. The night after, she had a vision of like a scary shadow man. The third night, she was visited by another vision, just like Jackson promised in her curse. Then another child, Hannah Trumbull, started having weird fits and became ill. She claimed it felt like she was being pricked by pins and said it was the work of Elizabeth Jackson. A priest was eventually called to help Hannah and while he was there, Hannah screamed out saying that Elizabeth was in the same room as them too and that she was going in and out of the oven. No clue what that means, but everyone was like, so she's guilty, she's a witch. 
So there was a lot of evidence built up against Elizabeth. During her trial, she was searched and they apparently found marks all over her body. An article said, and I quote, Under the hands of the woman, marks were found in diverse places of her body. These marks were determined to be unlikely to grow of any disease, but rather more like the marks which are described to be in witches' bodies. On July 19th, 1692, she was executed by hanging. Dude, Old English is messed up. Moving on to number four, we have Lassus Brigida. Lassus Brigida was an alleged Swedish witch back in the 1500s. In fact, she was the first woman executed for witchcraft in Sweden. Story goes that one night, her and two men met up at a churchyard cemetery with plans to resurrect people from the dead using their witchy powers. When they arrived at the church, Lassus used her powers to open the church doors. This involved her circling the place three times and then blowing into the keyhole. Magically it opened for them and they entered. While in the church, they were looking for a stole. You know, the scarf type pieces of cloth that are worn by priests? That was needed in order to complete the ritual. After finally finding it, she renounced God and swore herself to the devil. Somehow, people found out that the three had attempted to resurrect the dead and reported them. Lassus was decapitated for being a witch, whereas the other two men were just fined. That's rough, man. That's rough. I'm also glad that their plan to bring back the dead didn't work. Like, imagine they would have to fight off witches and then zombies. Crazy. Coming in at number three, we have Agnes Waterhouse. Agnes Waterhouse, otherwise known as Mother Waterhouse, was the first woman in England to be executed for witchcraft. Agnes confessed to being a witch and having a familiar named Satan, which was her cat. Later on, the cat apparently took the form of a toad. The familiar originally belonged to her friend and fellow witch, Elizabeth Francis, but was later passed along to her. Furthermore, apparently Agnes would use her sorcery for evil. In 1566, she used her witchcraft to try and cause illness to a man named William Fine, and he was not so fine. After that, she used her powers to kill her enemy's livestock and as well as cause them illness. And lastly, she also tried to kill her husband using her powers. In fact, at her trial, one of her neighbors, a 12-year-old girl named Agnes Brown, came forward and testified against her. She claimed that she was visited by a demon dog under the control of Agnes Waterhouse. So according to the girl, one day she was visited by this demon that looked like a black dog with a face of an ape with a short tail, a set of horns, and a silver whistle around its neck. The demon dog appeared at her home and asked for some butter. She refused and apparently later that day he returned with a knife and threatened to kill her. She said that he said that he was going to thrust his knife in her heart and kill her. When the girl bravely asked to send him, the dog just turned his head toward Waterhouse's home. On July 29th, 1566, Agnes Waterhouse was executed. Before doing so, she repented and begged God for forgiveness. She also did admit that she was sending her familiar to her and damage her neighbor's goods. But her neighbor, a tailor named Wardall, had such strong faith that the familiar was unable to mess with him. In the end, Agnes was hanged for her crimes. Moving on to number two, we have Elizabeth Francis. So Elizabeth Francis was friends with Agnes Waterhouse. Some even say that they were sisters. I don't know. But she was accused around the same time that Agnes was. She was the original owner of Satan, the white spotted cat and her familiar. According to Francis, she received the cat from her grandmother who was also a witch. Her grandmother, in fact, was the person who taught her all about witchcraft when she was only 12 years old. According to Elizabeth, her cat would speak to her in a strange, hollow voice and also would do anything in exchange for a drop of blood, which is why they could get him to do all of their dark bidding for them. During trial, Elizabeth confessed to stealing sheep and killing a number of people, including a man named Andrew Biles. Andrew refused to marry Elizabeth after she became pregnant with his child, so she killed him. Later on, her familiar told her to make a certain concoction of herbs and to drink it and that that would terminate her pregnancy. She did, and it worked. Not only that, but when Frances finally married, she got her familiar to kill her husband and her daughter. Agnes also confessed to using her powers and familiar to kill one of her own pigs to see, you know, what it could do. And then she also killed her neighbor's cows and geese after they got in an argument. She got in an argument with the neighbor, not with the cows and geese, thought I should clarify. As I said before, the cat eventually turned to a toad on its own. So Frances was the first witch to be accused, and then she was the one who told everyone about Agnes in order to get a lighter sentence. So Elizabeth wasn't killed right off the bat. 
But 13 years later, she was accused again, and that's when she was killed for witchcraft. And in our number one spot today, we have Lori Cabot. The story of Lori Cabot is one that still blows my mind to this day. So Lori is the high priestess of the Salem Coven. She is well known among modern day witches. Now Lori would only ever use her powers for good and to help people. In fact, she was psychic and she would use her psychic abilities in order to help police solve a number of crimes. The first time being during the disappearance and death of Martha Brailsford. So back in 1991, two people from Salem were reported missing. That was Martha Brailsford and her neighbor Tom Amoni. Eventually Tom returned home and said that the two were sailing when Martha fell off the boat after being hit by a rogue wave. So police began searching the bay for Martha, but they were unsuccessful. That's when one of the investigators who knew about Lori and her abilities reached out to her for her help. Using just Martha's name, location and birth, she was able to tune in and locate her. Lori then said she got visions of Tom trying to make advances on Martha, but Martha was not into it. When she rejected him, he dragged her to the side of the boat and struck her head. He then put weights on her hips and attached an anchor to her feet and tossed her overboard. She even saw exactly where in the water Martha was. And guess what? She was right about all of that. A local fisherman ended up finding her body in the location that Lori had said. And Martha did indeed have anchors and weights attached to her body. When Martha's body was located, Tom fled. And so Lori was once again asked for help, but this time locating Tom. She once again tuned in and got a vision of Tom in a cabin, and got a vibe he was on his way to cross into Canada. Not only that, but Lori performed a binding spell on Tom to make sure he would do something stupid so that he would get caught. Well, three days later, police found the cabin Tom was staying in, and it was in a small town near the Canadian border. They found the cabin because Tom made a stupid mistake. He parked his car near the cabin and he left the lights on. Neighbors called the cops because they didn't recognize the car and they knew the neighbors were out of town. Isn't that crazy? Third place, Ray Sherwood, the last convicted witch of Virginia. Also known as the Witch of Pungo, she was born in 1660 to carpenter John White and his wife Susan and married her husband, farmer James Sherwood, in 1680, whom she birthed three sons with. Grace was a renowned healer, growing her own herbs on their land, also acting as a midwife. While no official paintings or drawings of her exist, she is described as very attractive and tall, with a sense of humor. She was known to wear trousers instead of dresses while doing yard work something almost unheard of at the time. The first accusation of wrongdoing against her came in 1697, when Richard Capps accused her of using a spell to end the life of his bull, of which the court could not make a decision. Grace and her husband filed a countersuit, which was settled out of court. In 1698, Grace was then accused by neighbor John Gisburn of enchanting his pigs and cotton crop. No court action was taken this time, and another countersuit by the Sherwoods went nowhere. In that same year, Elizabeth Barnes alleged that Grace had taken the form of a black cat, entered the Barnes's home, jumped over her bed, whipped her, and left through the keyhole. The allegations went nowhere. Same for the countersuit, leaving the Sherwood couple to pay court fees for the third time. After her husband's death in 1701, Grace managed to dodge further allegations until 1705, when she got into a fight with neighbor Elizabeth Hill. She sued Elizabeth and her husband for a battery and was awarded damages of 20 shillings, so roughly the equivalent to 170 Canadian dollars today. In March, the Princess and County Justices assembled two juries, both made up of women, with the first being ordered to search Elizabeth's home for wax or baked items that might indicate she was a witch. Led by Elizabeth Hill herself, Grace was examined by the second jury of 12 ancient and knowing women, appointed to look for markings on her body that might be brands of the devil and they discovered two marks not like theirs or like those of any other woman known to them. On July 5th, the justices ordered a trial by ducking to take place. If Grace were to sink, she would be deemed innocent. If she were to float and survive, she would be declared as guilty and imprisoned. Around 10 a.m. on July 10th, she was taken down a dirt lane now known as Witch Duck Road to a plantation near the mouth of the Lynn Haven River. The event attracted people from all over the colony who began to shout, duck the witch. It is believed that her right thumb was bound to her left big toe and her left thumb to her right big toe, and then she was flung into the water where she quickly floated to the surface. The sheriff then tied a 13-pound Bible around her neck, causing her to sink, but she untied herself and returned to the surface, cementing her status as a witch. She was then imprisoned for eight years and lived quietly until her death in 1740. According to legend, 
her sons placed her body near the fireplace, and a wind came down the chimney, with her corpse disappearing amongst the embers. The only clue left behind was a cloven hoofprint. Stories about the devil taking her body, unnatural storms, and loitering black cats quickly arose after her death, and local men ended the life of every feline they could find. This widespread elimination of cats is believed to have caused the infestation of rats and mice in 1743. In at number four, we have Morgan Le Fay. Morgan Le Fay was a powerful enchantress in the fifth and Morgan Le Fay was a powerful enchantress in the fifth and sixth century, and she was related to King Arthur and was said to be his magical savior and protector. She was believed to be a goddess, a witch, and a sorceress. Morgan is skilled and learned what useful properties all herbs contain, so that she had the ability to cure the ailments and illnesses in the body. She also could shape shift and was able to fly. When King Arthur was wounded in battle, he was brought to her chamber, and she was easily able to cure him. So after that, she was committed to his care from then on. Morgan also used her healing skills with various of Arthur's knights of the round table, including Lancelot, who she fell in love with, and tried to seduce him, but he wasn't interested. Morgan showed Lancelot her incredible powers, and even though he had some powers as well, he was always defeated by the witch, and he described her as the most feared woman in the world. She soon is practicing more black magic and goes from helping and healing to becoming inherently evil. Morgan had the ability to communicate with the animals and sea creatures, ultimately giving her the name of the Empress of the Wilderness. When she began to demonstrate demonstrate her magical powers. It's believed the devil was her companion, and even brought Lucifer himself, disguising him as a dragon to destroy her enemies. Morgan is seen by many as a malicious and cruel sorceress, and some say that she was working to take over her King Arthur's throne through her harmful magic, scheming, and the ability to manipulate men. Most of the time, Morgan's witchcraft corresponds with those of other people like Merlin's and the Lady of the Lakes, featuring the ability to shapeshift, illusion, and casting sleeping spells. In at number one, we have Dion Fortune. Born Violet Mary Firth in 1890 in North Wales, Dion Fortune was a British occultist and author and said to be a modern day witch. She wrote often about the occult in both fiction and both non fictional stories. Dion possessed many abilities like contacting the dead, magical powers, and often had vision from her so called past lives. Once she recalled having visions at the age of four of Atlantis, and she believed that was one of her past lives. In 1924, she founded the Fraternity of the Inner Light, a magical society dealing with religious philosophy and alternative realities. The fraternity's rituals were carried out under dim light, with Dion claiming bright light disperses etheric forces. A light would be placed on the altar while incense was burned, and the members would begin walking around the room, chanting with the intent of building a psychic force. Next, the cosmic entities would be invoked, with the members believing that these entities would manifest in astral form and interact with the chosen ones. The magical principles on which her fraternity were based were adapted from the late 19th century Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, with other influences coming from Theosophy and Christian science. The magical ceremonies performed by Dion's group were placed into two categories initiation, in which the candidate was introduced to magical forces, and evocation, where these forces were manipulated for a given purpose. Dion died in 1924, leaving behind her magical society, which has survived to this day. Her novels, in particular, influenced on later occult and modern pagan groups such as Wicca. Author Ronald Hutton wrote a book called The Triumph of the Moon A History of Modern Pagan Witchcraft, he considers her the foremost female figure of British occultism. She is recognized by many as one of the most significant occultists and ceremonial magicians of the early 20th century.